Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing histone modification. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel because your support really means a lot to us and we really appreciate it. So with that being said, let's discuss histone modification by first discussing DNA. And DNA is our genetic code. It's located in the nucleus of eukaryotes in the prokaryotes. It is located in the cytoplasm just writing that down for you guys okay now our dna is a polymer of nucleotides like these deoxyribonucleotides right here and there are several mechanisms of controlling dna transcription one of which we discussed in our previous video which is dna methylation it's also shown right here essentially dna methylation is when you add a methyl group to a base like in this case we have cytosine and the methyl group is added to this hydrogen right here to create methylated cytosine now the key thing to remember is dna methylation actually causes a decrease in DNA transcription very important to understand because this is the basis of DNA transcription decrease now the other type of mechanism for controlling DNA transcription is histone modification specifically acetylation and deacetylation this is what we're going to be discussing today before we do that however we got to discuss what histones are histones are proteins that essentially function to condense DNA that's they're located inside of the chromatin and this right here is a structural component of what histones look like as you can see you have a eight member core and one histone on the outside the h1 histone they function to condense uh, dna into the metaphase chromosome that you ultimately see but they also function to control dna transcription now there are five main components of histones the first one is the most important which is the h1 histone that is what is on the outside and you can see this in this photo it is the cylindrical component located externally to the actual histone core then you have the h2a h2b h3 and h4 subunits all of these are located in pairs that means you actually have a subunit Core, and you have one subunit on the outside that means you have a nine subunit structure when it comes to a histone so let's talk a little bit more about histones. They're essentially basic amino acid proteins, and they are majority uh, majority of histones are composed of lysine and arginine uh, amino acids. And the the reason why they're basic is because they end up having a positive charge on the proteins. These proteins being positively charged means that it's going to be easier for histones to bind to DNA because the backbone of DNA, the phosphate backbone, is a negative charge. So you have the positively charged histone binding to the negatively charged DNA making a perfect uh, bond occurring which makes this whole uh, the, the whole function of histones possible now the H1 subunit is the most important this is very high yield often you can get be, you can be tested on what component lies outside you can be tested on which of the these components uh, function to hold the histone together the answer is usually going to be the H1 histone so if there's one component you can remember remember the H1 subunit this is located outside of the nucleosome core, which is just the DNA and the histone. And the H1 histone is the largest subunit, but it's also more basic. Now remember, the more basic uh, the protein, the better it's going to bind to the DNA. And that's what the H1 subunit essentially is. It holds the nucleosome together and it condenses the nucleosome segment so that you can get this conde condensation of DNA occurring in this photo as you go down it. That's why the H1 histone is so high yield to remember and you shouldn't forget it. Now, similar to DNA methylation, histone acetylation is one way we can control the transcription of DNA. And DNA transcription and transition, but transcription specifically, is a highly conserved mechanism, mainly because if it was not conserved, if we were able to synthesize RNA and proteins, we would be having uh, a, a crazy growth occurring in cells. Those cells would be very active and essentially you would see uh, cancer forming. That's why DNA transcription and translation are so highly conserved. It's because you want to prevent cancer from forming. 
Histone acetylation is just one of the mechanisms that we'd use to control DNA transcription and DNA replication, just like DNA methylation was another type of control mechanism. Histone acetylation consists of an acetyl group, hence why it's called acetylation, an acetyl group being added to the lysine residues on the histone. When you add this acetyl group, you're going to allow the histone to actually relax the uh, chromatin, and that's going to allow transcription to occur. The histone acetylation is going to cause an increase in DNA transcription. Compare that to DNA methylation, and that is going to cause a decrease in DNA transcription. That is very important to understand that histone acetylation and DNA methylation are essentially inverses of each other. Now, you can deacetylate, you can remove the acetyl group. Okay, from a histone, and that's gonna make uh, it's gonna reverse essentially this action, and it's gonna make transcription harder. This is gonna be equivalent to, but not exactly the same. Okay, it's gonna be equivalent to DNA methylation. That's how I always remembered it. Now, saying this is really easy, but it's better to just see it happening. So we're gonna look at this diagram. As you can see here, you have the closed chromatin, uh, the closed DNA structure. You have these histone uh, subunits, right? H1A, H. 2B, H2A, H3, and H4, and you can see how these are so tightly wound up that it's going to be nearly impossible for any protein to get to the DNA and transcribe it. When you add an acetyl group via histone acetyltransferase, you are essentially going to cause an opening to occur. The chromatin is going to get relaxed, and this relaxation is going to allow some enzyme or some, some protein to essentially come in and bind to this part of the DNA and cause uh, some sort of transcription to occur for, for a period of the DNA, right? And the whole DNA is not going to be transcribed, but these areas can be transcribed. Now, if you remove this acetyl group, if you remove any of these acetyl groups and you take out an acetyl-CoA, you are then going to go back to the closed chromatin structure, which is going to cause a decrease in DNA transcription. Pretty straightforward if you look at it this way. Now, you need to know the clinical context of histones uh, because they come back in a few disease states. Number one is drug-induced lupus. This is an autoimmune disorder that's similar to lupus that can be caused by a reaction to a medication. And like I said, it's similar to SLE, but it's not exactly the same. We're going to talk about why it's not exactly the same in a second. But commonly, drug-induced lupus can occur from several uh, medications, three of which you definitely need to know, and those or isoniazid, hydralazine, and procainamide. We added additional uh, medications you should know, but for the sake of any quick uh, uh, exam questions, any uh, small details you want to have, any high yield content, is essentially these three drugs that you need to commit to your memory. Isoniazid, hydralazine, and procainamide. All three of these are very important to uh, the to, to causing drug-induced lupus, essentially. Now, the key thing to remember is in drug-induced lupus, you're going to have anti-histone antibodies. That's where the clinical correlation of the clinical context comes into play when it comes to histones. Drug-induced lupus causes an antibodies to form for our histones. Now, when it comes to normal lupus, it's not going to be the same. 95% of patients actually have uh, these antihistone antibodies in drug-induced lupus. And when it comes to normal lupus, instead of having the antihistone antibodies, you're going to have anti-double-stranded DNA um, for those patients with classic SLE. That's one clinical context. The other clinical context is Huntington's disease. This is a movement disorder that's characterized by an abnormal, an abnormal Huntington protein. This is going to lead to neuronal death in the striatum, and it's a gain-of-function disease, meaning you're going to gain the function of creating an abnormal Huntington protein. One uh, thought, one mechanism or one thought process is that histone deacetylation, which is going to cause a decrease in DNA transcription, 
okay? This histone deacetylation is uh, thought to be the cause of the production of the abnormal Huntington protein. This means that the decreased transcription is going to lead to gene silencing occurring, which is going to cause the Huntington protein to not be functional, and it's going to be abnormal. And with that being said, that's pretty much everything you need to know for histones. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, and we'll see you back here real soon.